Are you ready to get into y'all's word today? Amen. I am as well. I want you to open your Bibles with me to Deuteronomy chapter 19. We're going to begin with verse 15 in just a moment. And I've entitled this message today, The Three Witnesses of Scripture. The Three Witnesses of Scripture. Deuteronomy chapter 19, beginning with verse 15. It says, One witness does not rise up against a man concerning any crookedness, or any sin that he commits. In other words, you cannot convict a person of a crime with only one witness. One witness is never enough. It goes on to say, at the mouth of two witnesses, say two witnesses, or at the mouth of three witnesses, say three witnesses, a matter is established. So if you're going to establish a matter, you have to have two or three witnesses. Witnesses. So if a person makes an accusation against someone, that person must back up that accusation with two or three witnesses. So if you have someone coming to you and is making an accusation or slandering someone, you want to find out about the witnesses. Sometimes they'll say, well, I was told. Well, it's not an ear witness. It's an eye witness. And if you convict someone in your heart because you have someone coming and bringing an accusation that is an ear witness, well, I was told that so-and-so is doing something, all right? That is bearing false witness. Now, what does the scripture say about bearing false witness? That the punishment that that person that you slandered would receive because of your slander, you receive. Amen? Now, if we understood that, I think a lot... Fewer people would go around slandering people. Can you say amen? amen? So you have to have two or three witnesses for anything to be established. Deuteronomy chapter 17 and verse 6 says, At the mouth of two or three witnesses shall he that is to die be put to death. He is not put to death by the mouth of one witness. So people need to stop murdering other people in their heart when there's only one witness or one ear witness. Can you say amen? So one witness is not enough. So what did Yeshua teach about this? Go with me over to Matthew chapter 18. We're going to pick up with verse 15. Yeshua said, and if your brother sins against you. Now he's not talking about, well, someone hurt your feelings. He's talking about someone transgressed the Torah and you were the negative recipient of that sin. All right. So if someone sins against you, go and convict him. In other words, go make your case before him. Tell him how he has broken the Torah and how you've received the negative impact of it. Go and convict him between you and him alone. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. You convinced your brother and he can repent. And when he repents and he performs restitution, then the relationship can be restored. And that's the goal of this, that the relationship would be restored. Look at verse 16. But if he does not hear, if he refuses to hear your case, take with you one or two more. All right. Now, this is not talking about counselors. This is not talking about pastors. This is not talking about elders. What is this talking about? One or two more who witnessed this matter. Why? Because you need two or three witnesses to establish this matter. Amen? So you're one witness. If you bring one more, you've got two. You're one witness. If you bring two more, you've got three. You've got a stronger case if you have three witnesses than if you only have two witnesses. But the Torah says you can bring an accusation against someone if you have two strong eyewitnesses. Can you say amen? Look at verse 16 again. But if he does not hear, take with you one or two more. Here it is, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word might be established. Did you understand? Did you realize that Yeshua was quoting the Torah? Deuteronomy chapter 19, verse 15. Verse 17. And if he refuses to hear them, refuses to hear whom? The witnesses. Say it to the assembly. So you take it to the elders of the assembly and they'll study out the matter and they'll make a judgment. All right. And if he refuses even to hear the assembly, let him be to you like the nations or the heathen. That's what this is meaning. 
and a tax collector. Well, tax collectors were considered traitors. In other words, disfellowship him, cut him off from his people. All right, so Yeshua was using this principle of two or three witnesses when he teaches about how we're to deal with people in the body that have sinned against us. If you don't understand that it's a Torah principle, you may completely misjudge what he's trying to teach here. Amen? All right, now go with me over to John chapter 8. We're going to pick up with verse 12. And here we see the Pharisees accuse Yeshua of not having enough witnesses. John chapter 8, beginning with verse 12. Therefore, Yeshua spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. Now, the scripture says the, the Torah is a light. And so Yeshua was basically declaring that he's the living Torah or that he is the Messiah. I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall by no means walk in darkness, but possess the light of life. Now he's making a declaration about himself. And notice how the Pharisees respond in verse 13. The Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness about yourself. Your witness is not true. In other words, one witness is not enough. All right. You bear witness of yourself. You don't have enough witnesses. Verse 14, Yeshua answered and said to them, even if I witness concerning myself, my witness is true. In other words, I'm not lying to you. All right. One witness may not be enough, but I'm telling you the truth about myself. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. I came from the Father and I'm going to the Father. But you do not know from where I come or where I go. In other words, you're ignorant of the things that I know. In other words, they're judging by the flesh. Look at verse 15. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. But even if I do judge, even if I do make a judgment, my judgment is true because I am not alone in it. In other words, I have more than one witness. But I am the Father who sent me. All right, so he's witnessing of himself. The Father also is witnessing, making two witnesses. All right. Verse 17 and in your Torah also, it has been written that the witness of two men is what? True. true. The witness of two eyewitnesses is true. So you can establish a matter by the mouths of two or three witnesses. I am one who witnesses concerning myself. And the Father who sent me witnesses concerning me. Again, He's just saying something that they knew. Maybe other religious people don't understand this principle because they never studied the Torah. But he's basically saying, out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, every word is established. And I'm witnessing for myself, and my father is also witnessing for me as well. And that makes two, and our witness is true. Now, let's ask the question, did Paul reflect in his teachings an understanding of this principle? Did he say anything about this principle of out of the mouths of two or three witnesses, every word is to be established? Well, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and pick up with verse 20. Shaul, or Paul, is writing to the congregation in, in Corinth, and he says, For I fear, lest when I come, I do not find you such as I wish. In other words, he's concerned he won't find them walking uprightly in Messiah. And I be found by you, such as you do not wish. What's he saying? Well, you're going to find me in set apart indignation if you don't change your ways and start obeying the scripture. Lest there be strife, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, slander, gossip, puffings up, unrests. And lest when I come again, my Elohim should humble me among you, or I shall be saddened, and I shall mourn for many who have sinned before and have not repented of the uncleanness and whoring and indecency which they have practiced. 
Now, who's he speaking to? Is he speaking to the world here, the lost world? Or is he speaking to those who claim to have called upon the name of Yeshua and are a part of the congregation in Corinth? Now, I think about the perverted grace doctrine that tells people not to repent because if you repent, then you're actually engaged in an activity that would cause you to lose the grace that's been poured out upon you. You say, well, I've never heard that. Well, that's what they're teaching. In other words, you've fallen from grace because you repent, because you're doing something. And yet we see right here that the Apostle Paul has been admonishing the believers in Corinth and saying there's strife, there's jealousies, there's outbursts of wrath, there's selfish ambitions, there's slander, there's gossip, there's pride, there's unrest. And he says, I've already charged you. We're going to get down to it here in a moment. He says, I've already charged you twice. And if I, if I have to come a third time and deal with this, then I'm not going to spare anybody. He's going to operate within his office of, of the apostle and, and make some judgments. All right. Look at verse one of chapter 13. This is the third time I am coming to you. Notice what he says. By the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. What's he doing? He's quoting Deuteronomy 19, verse 15. I have previously said, and I say beforehand, as being present the second time, and now being absent, I write to those who have sinned before and to all the rest, that if I come again, I shall not spare. Now, that's a little blind to us. Let me give you another version that makes it a little clearer. All right. I spoke a warning when I was with you the second time, though now I'm away. I'm again speaking a warning to those who have sinned before, as well as to all the rest, that if I come again, I will not spare anyone. So he somewhat broadened the definition of this. And he's saying, I've already spoken to you twice about this. If I come a third time, there's going to be trouble. There's going to be authority exercised. Amen. I'm not going to spare anyone. And then we see it in 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 17. It says, let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double respect, especially those who labor in the word and teaching. For the scripture says, what scripture is Shaul going to quote here? He's quoting the Torah. All right. You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain. That's Deuteronomy 25, verse 4. And the laborer is worthy of his wages. That's Leviticus 19, 13. And look at verse 19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three what? Witnesses. This is implying eyewitnesses, not ear witnesses. So we see this Torah principle was established in the first five books of Moses, and it's worked its way all the way through the Scripture. So we need to understand that every matter is established only at the mouth of two or three witnesses. Now, go with me to Hebrews chapter 10. We'll pick up with verse 26. And I want to show you the three witnesses that testify against a willful, hardened, unrepentant sinner. Okay? This is a very interesting passage of Scripture in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26. For if we sin, he's speaking concerning believers, and a sin is what? Transgression of the Torah. If we sin purposely, or you could say willfully, after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a slaughter offering for sins. Now, he's talking about the hardened, willful, unrepentant sinner who has rejected Messiah. All right? But some fearsome anticipation of judgment. So if you are in a lifestyle, your heart is hardened, you're in a lifestyle of willful, unrepentant sin. All right, this is what you can expect some fearsome anticipation of judgment, and a fierce fire which is about to consume the opponents. He's quoting Isaiah 26, verse 11 there. 
Anyone who has disregarded the Torah of Moshe dies without compassion, notice, on the witness of two or three witnesses. How much worse punishment do you think shall he deserve who has, implying by his lifestyle of willful sin, trampled the son of Elohim underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was set apart as common, and insulted the spirit of favor. For we know him who has said in Scripture, Vengeance is mine, I shall repay, says Yah. And again, Yah shall judge his people. And that's Deuteronomy chapter 32, verses 35 and 36. Look at verse 31. It is fearsome to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. And so what do we see here? We see three witnesses to that person whose heart is hard, who is unrepentant, who is willful in his sinful activities. And who are the three witnesses? Well, the first witness is the son of Elohim. It says, who trampled the son of Elohim underfoot. Now, we want Yeshua to be our advocate we want him to be our ever-living high priest who goes before the Father in the high court of heaven and pleads our case on our behalf, not according to what we did or didn't do, but according to what he accomplished on the tree when he died in our place and paid our death penalty. Amen? But for the hardened, willful, unrepentant sinner, he's not the advocate. He's a witness against that person. Think about that. Now, the second witness, it says, counted the blood of the covenant by which he was set apart as common. You see, how, how can blood be a witness? Well, the scripture says that the blood of Abel cried out to the Almighty because Abel was murdered by Cain. And then the scripture says that the blood of Yeshua speaks of greater things than the blood of Abel because the blood of Abel spoke of judgment and the blood of Yeshua for those who love Yeshua, who believe in Yeshua, who live according to the lifestyle of Yeshua. The blood of Yeshua speaks of forgiveness to us. But the scripture also tells us that the blood of Yeshua can be a witness against the hardened, willful, unrepentant sinner. And then it says, and insulted the spirit of favor. So the spirit of favor, or your Bible may say the spirit of grace, or the set-apart spirit, then becomes a witness against the hardened, willful, unrepentant sinner. So we have three witnesses. Can you say amen? And what does it say? Vengeance is mine, I shall repay, says Yah. And again, Yah shall judge his people. It is fearsome to fall into the hands of the living Elohim. You fall into his hands when you have three witnesses against you. All right, then go with me over to Luke chapter 24, beginning with verse 36. And here, Yeshua is going to tell us that there are three bodies of Scripture that are witnesses to him. For him to be able to establish that he's the Messiah, he needs two or three witnesses. And so what do we see here in Luke 24, beginning with verse 36? And as they were saying this, Yeshua himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, Peace to you. And being startled and frightened, they thought they had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself handle me. And see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see I have. And saying this, he showed them his hands and his feet. Look at verse 44. And he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all have to be filled or accomplished, that were written in the Torah of Moshe and the prophets and the Tehillim, or the Psalms, concerning me. So we see three bodies of Scripture who are the three witnesses of Yeshua that He is the Messiah. The Torah of Moshe is a witness. 
Now, how many of you believe that Yeshua is the Messiah? How many of you want the whole world to know that Yeshua is the Messiah? Then why in the world would a religion abolish the witnesses to Yeshua? You want to do away with the Torah of Moshe, yet the Torah of Moshe was written about Yeshua. If you silence the Torah of Moshe, you silence one of the witnesses. Can you say a good amen? The Torah of Moshe, one witness. The prophets, all of the prophetic writings speak of Yeshua. And the Psalms. All right, so you've heard of the Tanakh. Tanakh, that's a way to remember. The Torah, that's the Torah of Moshe. The Nevi'im, that's the prophets. The Ketuvim, that's the writings. All right, Tanakh, Tanakh, the original Hebrew scriptures. All of the original Hebrew scriptures are witnesses unto Yeshua. When religion says, oh, that's the Old Testament, and this is the New Testament, and we really don't pay much attention to anything that is left of Matthew, because that's old and it's passed away and it doesn't apply to us. If you silence everything left of Matthew, you have silenced the witnesses to Yeshua. He does not have a legal leg to stand on if you silence his witnesses. If you silence the witnesses of Yeshua like religion does, then you end up making stuff up. In other words, you have false witness. And that's what religion does. Religion is loaded with false witness. Stuff that men have made up. Amen. You might as well say amen. It'll go down easier if you say amen. Hallelujah. Now look at verse 45. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Isn't it interesting that he didn't say, now you need to go to the gospel of John and start there at the gospel of John. Because John said in the beginning was the word, you know, and religion does that. It always sends someone that just received Yeshua to the gospel of John. Why not send them to the beginning? To Genesis. Amen. It says, then he, Yeshua, opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Yeshua called the Torah, the prophets, and the writings the scriptures. All right. Well, you know why he didn't send them to the gospel of John. Because John hadn't written his gospel at that point. Amen. But the fact is, you can preach Yeshua. You must preach Yeshua out of the original Hebrew scriptures. Otherwise, you don't have the witnesses that are necessary to establish the matter. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures. This is something that the Spirit is doing in this hour that we're living in. People are, are no longer just embracing what religion is saying. They're hearing preachers preach and they're reading their Bibles and they're seeing that they don't quite match up. They're hearing about the traditions of men and they're reading their Bibles and they're seeing that Yeshua was constantly challenging the traditions of men. The man-made rules and regulations. Amen. That's what's happening today. He was the one who was leading people back to the written Torah. He never said, follow Judaism. He never said, I'm about to start a new religion, follow Christianity. He didn't say that. I've been searching my Bible for a lot of years, decades. I've never seen that. What did he say? Follow me. And then we see in the apostolic writings, it says, if anyone says that they abide in Yeshua, they must also walk just as he walked. Not walking in the path of religion, not walking in the traditions of men, but discovering how Yeshua walked, what he loved, what he hated, what he believed, and lining up your belief and your belief walk with his. How can two walk together unless they be agreed? He's coming back for his bride. Amen. The bride is not going to say, hey, Yeshua, come walk with me in all these pagan ways. 
Come celebrate with me all these Roman holidays. Let's put our emphasis on the first day of the week. Oh yeah, I know it's called Sunday, the day when the empire worshipped the God of the sun. No, no, it's going to be Sabbath, folks. Seventh day Sabbath. Amen? So many people, I believe, even in religion, they love Yeshua. They want to do right, but they've been told lies. And this is the hour when he is opening our minds to understand the scripture. And you ought to praise Yah every day that somehow, some way, under his divine ordinance, he brought you into contact with the truth. And that you survived when your tradition that you loved so dearly was challenged by truth. You're still here today. You survived it. Turn to your neighbor and say, I survived. Why did you survive? Because you love truth more than tradition. That's why you survived. You loved truth more than tradition. Amen. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who are on that path. If you ever hear somebody say, oh, let's do it. Everybody's doing it. That's a, that's a strong warning that if everybody's doing it, you ought not to be doing it. Because narrow and difficult is the way that leads to life. And there are how many that find it? Few. There are few that find it. Why is it that way? Because people love their tradition more than they love truth. Hallelujah. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. The scriptures, the Torah, the prophets, the writings. And said to them, thus it has been written, written in the scriptures. And so it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer as it was written in the scriptures and to rise again as it was written in the scriptures from the dead the third day and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. Notice he didn't say it was going to begin in Rome. When Yeshua comes back, is he going to rule from Rome? Is he going to lead everybody in the Roman calendar? Are we going to observe the Roman holidays? Are we going to worship on the day of the sun? So the question is, where do your roots end? You hear evangelicals and, you know, charismatics and people that are a little further down the line saying, well, we're not Catholics. If you're a Catholic here today, we love you. They say, we're not Catholics. Anybody that defines themselves according to what they're not, instead of what they are, you got to watch out for that. The question is, you say you're not a Catholic, but where do your roots end? Do they end in Rome? Are you doing what the Roman church established? Or do they end in Jerusalem? When Yeshua comes back, he's going to rule from Jerusalem. He's going to teach the Torah from Jerusalem. The lifestyle of his bride and those nations that are saved will be the lifestyle of the scripture. The question is, if you can't find Christmas in the Bible or Easter in the Bible, why are you doing it now? You can study the prophetic scriptures and find out what we're going to be doing in the kingdom when Yeshua comes back and establishes his kingdom. It speaks about celebrating the feast of Sukkot. Why Sukkot? It's one of Yah's feasts. He didn't change. He never changes. I am Yah. I change not. Yeshua Messiah the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if what we're doing today doesn't match what's been done, he didn't change. Religion changed. Can you say amen? amen. And so if you want to be safe, love what Yeshua loved. Hate what Yeshua hated. 
Do what Yeshua did. Believe what Yeshua believed. Walk as Yeshua walked. And you'll be safe. He's coming back for his bride. The one he knows intimately. Can you say amen? amen. Now quickly go with me over to John chapter 5. And Yeshua said the scriptures, the scriptures that were breathed out by the Father are witnesses of him. John chapter 5 verse 30. Yeshua said, of myself, I am unable to do no matter. As I hear, implying as I hear from my Father, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own desire, but the desire of the Father who sent me. So how do we discover the desire or the will of the Father? By reading the Torah. So Yeshua judged all things according to the Torah. He's not going to judge outside of the Torah. To have a righteous judgment, you judge by the Torah. The guidelines and the instructions of the Almighty. The Torah simply means instructions. Poorly translated into the English as law, it means instructions. Can you say amen? Verse 31, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. So he's focusing again on this principle you have to have two or three witnesses. One witness is not enough. There is another who bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. And he's talking about Yochanan the Immerser or John the Baptist. Verse 33, you have sent to Yochanan. They actually sent out scribes and priests to talk to Yochanan about who he was. And he witnessed of Yeshua. And he bore witness to the truth. Look at verse 34. But I do not receive witness from man. I think that's a really strong statement. Yeshua can make his case that he is the Messiah simply by using the scripture. The scripture is breathed out by Yah himself. He doesn't need another man's witness. Although he is going to mention Yochanan right here. But I say this in order that you might be saved. He was the burning and shining lamp. And for a while you wish to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness. Everybody say a greater witness. Than that of Yochanan. For the works that the Father gave me to accomplish. The works that I do bear witness of me. So Yeshua is a witness. The works that he did is another witness. That the Father has sent me. Verse 37. And the Father who sent me, he bore witness of me. Where does the Father bear witness of Yeshua? In the scripture. In the scripture, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings. Amen. Now we know from scripture that when Yeshua was baptized and came up out of the water, Abba Father bore witness. He said, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Amen. But the scripture, the scripture are the main witnesses to Yeshua. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. And you do not have his word, Elohim's word, Staying in you. Now, what word is he talking about here? He's talking about the Tanakh. He's talking about the original Hebrew scriptures. You do not have his word staying in you because you do not believe him whom he sent. You don't believe the witnesses of the word. The Torah, the prophets, and the writings concerning me is basically what he's saying. Look at verse 39. You search the scriptures because you think you possess everlasting life in them. And these are the ones that bear witness of me. In other words, you believe in the witnesses, but you don't believe in the one in whom they are witnessing. You're all in support of the witnesses, but you won't believe their witness. Verse 40, but you do not desire to come to me in order to possess life. I do not receive esteem from men, but I know you, that you do not have the love of Elohim in you. What is the love of Elohim? We've taught you that. It's obedience to the scripture. In other words, you're not obeying the scripture. I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. In other words, you're disregarding the witness of the word. If another comes in his own name, some rabbi or some prominent man, him you would receive. How are you able to believe when you are receiving esteem from one another? 
See, instead of heeding the witness of Scripture, you heed the traditions of men and desire to please one another instead of pleasing Elohim. It's all about man in religion. It's all about pleasing men in religion. Yeshua was constantly challenging the religious leaders of his day who were supporting their man-made religion and their traditions of men and in doing so, in some cases, even breaking the written Torah of Yah. And he was bringing people back to the written word. Verse 44, how are you able to believe when you are receiving esteem from one another? And the esteem that is from the only Elohim you do not seek. Do not think that I shall accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moshe, the prophet through whom the Torah was delivered. In whom you have set your expectation or your hope. So their hope is in Moshe, but they're not paying attention to whom Moshe wrote about. He was a witness to Yeshua. For if you believed Moshe, you would have believed me since he wrote about me. He's one of the witnesses. If you truly believed Moshe, you would have believed and accepted me because he was a witness of me. He told you about me. That's what Yeshua is saying there. But if you do not believe his writings, how shall you believe my words? See, if you don't believe Moshe's writings, Moses' writings, if you don't believe the Torah, if you've disregarded the Torah, you may say you believe in Yeshua, but how can you even interpret Scripture if you have silenced one of the voices of the witness to Yeshua? What happens when that takes place? Religion ends up making stuff up. All right? So we can't even believe and understand Yeshua's words unless we believe the Torah. Amen? Amen. The Torah is not at war with what's called the New Testament. All of Scripture agrees. It all agrees. If you can't make it agree or if you think what's called the Old Testament is at war with the New Testament, that the Old Testament was all about law and the New Testament is all about grace and they're at war with one another... You don't understand the nature of Scripture. All of Scripture agrees. If you think it doesn't agree, the problem is not with Scripture. It's with your interpretation. Amen? All right. Now let's look quickly at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15. Yeshua said in the previous passage, If you do not believe Moses' writings, how shall you believe my words? Now, this is one of the most notable passages in the Torah concerning Yeshua. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15 says, Yah, your Elohim shall raise up for you a prophet like me, like Moshe, from your midst, from your brothers. Listen to him. It says, according to all you asked of Yah, your Elohim, in Horeb, in the day of the assembly, saying, let me not hear again the voice of Yah, my Elohim, nor let me see this great fire Anymore, lest I die. The fire and the darkness and the great sounds and the lightnings and the thunderings and the, the shofar blast that got louder and louder. It terrified them. And they cried out and they said, we don't want to experience that anymore. You know, let us have a prophet that will go up and hear from you and come back and speak to us. Well, Moshe was that first prophet. But here we see there's going to be another prophet, someone that's going to declare the word of Yah to the people. Look at verse 17. And Yah said to me, this is Moshe speaking, what they have spoken is good. I shall raise up for them a prophet like you out of the midst of their brothers. And I shall put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And it shall be the man who does not listen to my words, which he speaks in my name. I require it of him or I will judge that one that doesn't listen to Yeshua. This is talking about Yeshua. All right. Go quickly to Luke chapter 16. And I want to show you that Yeshua teaches that men should hear Moshe and the prophets. Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 23. This is concerning the rich man. This is the story of the rich man and Lazarus. All right. Concerning the rich man. And while suffering 
tortures in Sheol, having lifted up his eyes, he saw Abraham far away and Eleazar, or Lazarus, in his bosom. And crying out, he said, Father Abraham, have compassion on me and send Eleazar to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am suffering in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that in your life you received your good, and likewise Eleazar the evil. But now he is comforted, and you are suffering. And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been set, so that those who wish to pass from here to you are unable, nor do those from there pass to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, that you would send him, that's Eleazar, Lazarus, to my father's house, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them, lest they also come to this place of torture. And Abraham said to him, They have, what does it say? They have Moshe and the prophets. All right, two witnesses, implying that they are witnesses. Let them hear them. Yeshua said men ought to hear Moshe and the prophets. This was a lesson that Yeshua himself taught that men ought to hear Moshe, who wrote the Torah, and the prophets. All right? So as a follower of Yeshua, this puts tremendous significance and importance on the Torah and the prophets. What, what is religion doing abolishing the Torah and the prophets? Yeshua himself said, you must listen to Moshe and the prophets. They have Moshe and the prophets. Let them hear them. Verse 30, and he said, no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they shall repent. But he said to, to him, if they do not hear Moshe and the prophets, neither would they be persuaded, even if one should rise from the dead. So Yeshua stands with his witnesses. Keep that in mind. He stands with his witnesses. He's going to uphold his witnesses. He's making a case that he's the Messiah. He needs to have his witnesses. He, he has not placed a seal of approval on religion who abolishes his witnesses. All of the Bible is true. The sum of your word is true. And all of your right rulings are for how long? Forever. Amen. Well, we know that Moshe and Eliyahu or Elijah appeared with Yeshua on the Mount of Transfiguration. We won't read that today, but that's Luke chapter 9, verses 26 through 36. I would encourage you to go and read that. Yeshua went up on the mountain with Kepha and Yochanan and Yaakov, with Peter, John, and James, and they saw as this transfiguration began to take place, that Yeshua was walking with whom? With Moshe, or Moses, and Eliyahu. All right, Moshe representing the law or the Torah, and Elijah representing what? The prophets, his two witnesses. All right, so he's got two witnesses he's walking with. They got to see the kingdom, the scripture says. And then go with me over to Hebrews Chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. Yeshua's words are the fullness of the Torah and the prophets. So, the voice came out of the cloud on the Mount of Transfiguration. It was the Almighty speaking. He said, this is my son, the beloved. Hear him. Hear him. So, he's going to become now the fullness of of the Torah and the prophets. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 says, Elohim, having of old spoken in many portions and many ways to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by the Son, whom he has appointed heir of all, through whom also he made the ages, who being the brightness of the esteem and the exact representation of his substance, and sustaining all by the word of his power, having made a cleansing of our sins through himself, set down at the right hand of the greatness on high. So that's a reference to Psalm 110 verse 1. So Yeshua's words 
are the fullness of the Torah and the prophets. He didn't come to speak anything different. He exalts the Torah and the prophets to their deeper spiritual application. Yeshua's words are always going to agree with Moshe's words. They're always going to agree with the words of the prophets and the Psalms. David was, was a prophet. David was a prophet uh, when he wrote those Psalms. It's so prophetic. And so Yeshua's words are not different words. They're in agreement with Moshe and with the prophets. Yeshua didn't come to abolish the Torah or the prophets, but to preach them in their fullness. Okay, quickly, we've preached on this a lot, but I want to insert it here just to build this case today. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Yeshua said, Do not think I came to destroy the Torah or the prophets. Doesn't that only make sense in light of what we're talking about? Why would the Messiah come and abolish his own witnesses? He didn't come to abolish his witnesses. He didn't come to destroy the Torah or the prophets. He said, I did not come to destroy, but to complete. In other words, to preach them to their fullness. To exalt them to their deeper spiritual application. All right. For truly, I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away, one yod, that's the smallest of the Hebrew letters in the Hebrew alphabet, or one tittle, that's the little decorations on the letters, shall by no means pass from the Torah till all be done or till everything written is accomplished. All right? Now, are there prophetic words in the Torah and the prophets that have not been fulfilled yet? Yes. So there has not been one yod or tittle that has been dissolved or passed away. Look at verse 19. Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands, what commandments is he talking about here? The Torah commands. And teaches men so shall be called least in the reign of the heavens. There's a lot of people in religion who are teaching what they've been taught. And that is that the Torah has been abolished. Now they may be sincere in their hearts, but they're sincerely wrong about that. All right. Yeshua said, if you break the commandments and teach others to break them, you will be least in my kingdom. And look, look what else he says here. Whoever then breaks one of the least of these commands and teaches Men so shall be called least in the reign of the heavens, but whoever does, obeys them, and teaches them the Torah commandments, he shall be called great in the reign of the heavens. Amen. Well, the Almighty is the, the ultimate steward. He's not going to put a novice in authority. Yeshua is going to be teaching Torah from Jerusalem. There's going to be some folks there that are going to have to sit in class. Amen. All right, quickly, Romans chapter 3 and verse 21. Shaul or Paul says the Torah and the prophets are witnesses to the righteousness that comes through belief in Yeshua. Verse 21, but now apart from Torah or apart from Torah obedience alone. He's talking to, he, he so often had to deal with the Jewish people who were saying that they were justified by Torah obedience alone. They didn't need to believe in Yeshua. They didn't need his Yeshua and this preaching of Yeshua. They could be justified by Torah obedience alone. But Shaul is saying here, apart from Torah or apart from Torah obedience alone, a righteousness of Elohim has been revealed, being witnessed by the Torah and the prophets. Witnessed by whom? The Torah and the prophets. And the righteousness of Elohim is through belief in Yeshua Messiah to all and on all who believe. Go to Acts chapter 3, starting with verse 15. This is Kepha or Peter. But you killed the prince of life whom Elohim raised from the dead of which we are witnesses. And by the belief in his name, in Yeshua's name, Yeshua means the salvation of Yah. It means something in Hebrew. This one whom you see and know, his name made strong. So this lame man was healed by the name of Yeshua. And the belief which comes through him, through Yeshua, has given him this perfect healing before you all. And now, brothers, I know that you did it in ignorance as 
your rulers did too. But this is how Elohim has filled what he had announced beforehand. Notice, through the mouth of all the prophets that his Messiah was to suffer. So if you read the writings of the prophets, they are witnesses to his suffering. Verse 19, repent therefore and turn back for the blotting out of your sins in order that times of refreshing might come from the presence of the master and that he sends Yeshua Messiah pre-appointed for you whom heaven needs to receive until the times of refreshing of all matters, here it is, of which Elohim spoke through the mouth of all his set-apart prophets since of old. All right, they are his witnesses. Verse 22, for Moshe, Moshe was a prophet, for Moshe truly said to the fathers in the Torah, Yah, your Elohim shall raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. Him you shall hear according to all matters, whatever he says to you. And it shall be that every being who does not hear that prophet shall be utterly destroyed from among the people. Again, we mentioned that verse just a moment ago. That's Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 19. Look at verse 24 here. And likewise, all the prophets have spoken from Shemuel or Samuel and those following have also announced these days. You are sons of the prophets and of the covenant which Elohim made with our father, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Of course, he's quoting Genesis chapter 12, verse 3. To you first Elohim, having raised up his servant Yeshua, sent him to bless you in turning away each one of you from your wicked ways. So again and again and again, I just want you to see this principle that was established in the Torah. We see it all through what's called the Brit Hadashah or what religion calls the New Testament. This principle of to establish any matter, there must be two or three Witnesses. So we see that the Torah and the prophets and the writings, the original Hebrew scriptures, are three witnesses of Yeshua, his suffering, his death, his burial, and resurrection. And he was sent as a blessing to turn us from our sins. And we can say hallelujah to that. Now, our final verse is Revelation chapter 11, verses 3 through 6. We see two witnesses of the tribulation. And I shall give unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,260 days clad in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that are standing before the Elohim of the earth. And if anyone wishes to harm them, fire comes from their mouth and consumes their enemies. Does that remind you of any stories? And if anyone wishes to harm them, he has to be killed in that way. Look at verse 6. These possess authority to shut the heaven so that no rain falls in the days of their prophecy. And they possess authority over waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they wish. Now, what does that remind you of? It reminds you of Moshe and the prophets. And so there are going to be two witnesses that represent the Torah and the prophets, and they're going to deal with those enemies of the Almighty in those final hours. Amen? So we see this principle of needing two or three witnesses to establish a matter running from the Torah all the way to the book of Revelation. Hallelujah! How many of you know Yeshua has his witnesses? He not only has three witnesses in the scripture, but he's made us all witnesses. Amen. And he's charged us all and called us all to go into all the world and preach the whole good news to every creature. We have become his witnesses. Amen.